Good morning, friends. Welcome to our Sunday service for May 10th, brought to you by St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church in Duncan and St. Columba Presbyterian Church in Parksville. Today is also Mother's Day Sunday, so we welcome and we give thanks to God for the gift of motherhood. Uh, and uh, happy Mother's Day to all the moms out there. Brothers and sisters, come and worship, for we are a chosen people, royal priesthood, and a holy nation, God's very own family. So let us proclaim together the goodness of God, who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Let us worship God. I invite you to bow your heads together in prayer. Let us pray. Father God, you are the refuge in times of trouble and our shelter when we are afraid. In you alone we trust. In you we see our way forward and discover what is authentic. In you we find abundant life. And so we offer you our worship this morning and our love. As the Father God who creates and gives life to the world, as the Son of God who preached the truth of the good news, and the Holy Spirit who guides us this day and always. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Please join me in our song of worship, Lord, I Need You. Lord, I come, I confess, bowing here I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart, you're the one that guides my heart. Lord, I need you, oh, I need you. Every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you. Where sins run deep, your grace is more, where grace is found is where you are, and where you are, Lord, I am free, holiness is Christ in me, Lord, I need you, oh, I need you, every hour I need you, my one defense, my righteousness, oh God, how I need you, so teach my song to rise to you, when temptations scripture today comes from 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 2 to 10. Like newborn babies crave pure spiritual milk so that by it you may grow up in your salvation now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him the living stone rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him. You also like living stones are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in Scripture it says, 
See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious, but to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of the darkness into the wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. I think it was in my early teens that I came to know Jesus Christ and accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Uh, at that time, I had experienced this overwhelming sense of peace and almost a sense of euphoria uh, and a sense of peace in my heart. Uh, when I walked out of the sanctuary that afternoon, uh, the whole world seemed perfect. I was perfectly happy, content with life. And it was perhaps the most wonderful experience I've ever had. And Jesus felt so real, so near, with so much love that I couldn't contain myself and with all the excitement, yet still at the same time experienced so much peace and calmness in my heart. Now the reason why I share that with you is because the early Christians, the early church, also experienced the same salvation, the same experience of Jesus Christ. And Peter is reminding the church that is meeting in Asia Minor, modern-day Turkey, of how they began their faith. And Peter says, Like newborn babies, crave pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow up in your salvation. So he is comparing growing up and maturing and beginning a new faith life and a relationship with Jesus Christ as, uh, uh, as, as being fed as pure spiritual milk as you're growing A new Christian is born again, just like a baby. Uh, And a newborn, as a newborn, you have to start off with, uh, well, milk, mother's milk or or baby food, uh, or or spiritual milk for the early Christians. It means that you have a lot of growing up to do. So, uh, yes, we can talk a lot about what it means to be fed spiritual milk and, and, and moving on to hard, uh, you know, hard food and more, uh, more chewable food and things like that and the steps that we take. But I wanted to actually digress from that and talk about the implications of what it means to be growing up as a baby. So you're born, what, seven, six, seven, eight pounds, and then quickly goes to 17, 18 pounds, and you get to about 70 pounds, and then you grow to about 170 pounds or, or more or less. You know, you begin by being, what, 10, 15, 12 inches, 14, 15 inches, and then you grow to 2 feet, 3 feet, 4 feet, 5 feet, 6 feet, and you continue to grow. Uh, you grow a mustache, you grow a beard, you grow hair, and then you lose your hair. You gain weight, you lose weight, your facial expression changes, your body stature and form changes. All of that changes over the years as you're, as you're continuing to grow and age. What does that look like for us spiritually? And what is, that, what is Peter talking about? It means you have a lot of growing up to do. There's a lot of changes. Whether they be easy or difficult, you necessarily go through spiritual growth, and that means change. So it also means that you can't, ch- you can't stay where you're at and be content with it. Oftentimes, <clears throat> uh, we get confused with our insistence about our uh, tolerance, about acceptance of individual rights or freedom of thought and expression. Uh, personal character, uh, personal habits, our moral values, and so on and so on and so on. And sometimes we find ourselves not so willing to change and insist that it is perfectly within my rights to demand that I do not change and that others recognize and authenticate and legitimize who I am, exactly where I am, by giving me their approval 
for my rights and for my insistence to remain the same. So you're unwilling to change, and you're asking everybody to accept your unwillingness to change. Think about that for, for a while as, as the week, as we begin a new week. <clears throat> to be fed spiritual milk means you are growing up. It is our discipleship. You are growing up to be like Christ, Christ-like. So everything is fair game. Everything is fair game for change. There is absolutely nothing that can be reserved or protected from the demand for change and for growth and maturity. If it is in conflict with what it means for us to be Christ-like, to be a disciple of Jesus Christ, then it must change and we must grow. So this is where I think submission to God's word, humility, and obedience all comes into play. And verse 3 goes on to say, Now that you have tasted that the Lord is good. The reason and motivation behind why Christians are instructed to take baby steps in growing and maturing is because of how good it is. You've tasted how good salvation in the Lord is. To grow and mature is good, and it's even going to get better. That is discipleship. Discipleship and obedience and humility and commitment to be Christ-like, I don't think it's a chore. It's not like going to the dentist to have your root canal. or uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's a complete and utter joy. It's life-affirming. It's pure peace. It is our calling in life to grow step by step in Christ, to be like him. And that is absolute pure joy. So that is our purpose and our motivation and the reason as to why Peter, through, through Peter, God commends us to grow and mature. And verse 4, 5 and 6, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable God, to God through Jesus Christ. For in scriptures it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. It is so theologically rich and dense in that several verses that we've just read and heard. In a nutshell, it is trying to tell us, Peter is trying to tell the readers, that Jesus is the main focal point that makes everything turn around and turn and work. God the Father chose his son Jesus to be the sacrifice for our sin. When we accept and receive the everlasting life that Jesus offers, we are included into the household of God. We are of God's royal pedigree, priests, sacred, set apart to do God's holy work. And God's plan and promise is that if you accept the work of sacrifice that Jesus has done for you, that you will be saved and you will be able to taste how good that is. Verse 7 and 8. Now to you who believe, the stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. So I think what it's trying to say is that we have a choice. People have a choice. Human beings have the freedom to choose. Because God gave us the gift of free will for us to willingly, volitionally be able to choose. So we must choose or to, to either reject God or to receive and accept God through the ministry of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, it would not be salvation. And we would simply, if we were not given the free will or the ability to choose, then we'd simply be robots, right? So... It would be a moot point. 
And Peter says that humanity from its very ori origin has rejected Christ. Christ who is the cornerstone, the focal point. The focal point of salvation and the key that makes it possible for us to enter into a loving relationship with God the Father, which is through the work of Jesus Christ. From our origin, Peter says, humanity has rejected this through our disobedience. And then we go to the passages that we're all so very familiar with. Verse 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into this wonderful light. Once you were a people, not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We're so familiar with this passage, aren't we? To be the holy nation, a priesthood means that we're sacred. We're, we're forgiven of our sins and we're a people that belong to God. And we appreciate that and we are thankful for that eternally. And it is absolutely reassuring for us to know that this special privilege of moving out of the dark into light is offered to us by God's grace. You know, when I'm uh, hiking around Vancouver Island, and if I get lost in the woods, or at the, at the point of getting lost, near getting the, lost in the woods, and I lose my bearings, I, I always try to reference where I am by where I started from in relation to where I am headed. So I try to make a beeline between my starting point and where I'm headed. And that gives me the bearing or a clue as to which direction I need to continue to go to be able to find my way back to the path again. The two points, the beginning and the end, are directly related to each other. In order for us to fully appreciate what it means for us to be called a royal priesthood, I think we must first appreciate who we were and to humbly look back. We rejected God, we disobeyed God, and we lived in darkness. But because of what Christ has done for us on the cross, we're now the people of light. To look back means to comprehend the absolute impossibility of how we can move from or change from or grow from, from death because of sin into life because of Jesus. How is that possible? It isn't. It's, it's, it's absolutely impossible. So that is our, our, our ability to look back and to consider the impossibility of, of how we can move from our sin to forgiveness and new life. And our only answer to that is it is because of God's love for us, for you and I. God's love and Jesus' death and resurrection and the work of illumination and revelation of the Holy Spirit makes it possible. Now, is that a good thing or not? I think it's an absolutely a good thing for us to taste and to see and to experience. The early church, early Christians experienced this good thing. You have experienced this good thing. And some of you may still be waiting to taste the goodness of the offer of salvation through Jesus Christ. Give God thanks for the new life that you have tasted. And commit yourselves to continue to grow in your salvation. To be open and willing, humble and obedient. To change. To be more Christ-like. And for those of you who may be sitting on the fence, consider where you were. And look back, but also look forward. Look forward to the possibility of the goodness that now God brings to you and offers to you. And place your, hand, your life into the hands of Jesus and accept the offer of being included into the holy nation of God. Let us pray. And we continue in our worship by giving of our tithes and our thanksgiving offerings. So we'll pray for our prayer, uh, offering prayer at this time. Let us pray. 
Generous God, generous Father, we bless you for your gift of life renewed through Christ's love and through springtime growth in fields and gardens. Bless the gifts that we bring to you now. May they offer hope and renewal in the world you love as we serve in the name of your greatest gift, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Good morning. I'm Helen Hill, too, from St. Columba. I'm an elder here, and I am the musical director. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that we can still connect through this time of stress. Help us to acknowledge that you are with us, that you are, will be with us forever. Lord, we lift up the congregations of St. Columba and St. Andrews. We pray that each member, each adherent, Lord, will feel your presence, will know that you are with them no matter what. Yes. Be with our governments, Lord, and help them to make the correct decisions. Help them to make the decisions that are according to your will, Lord. Help them to know what it is that they need to do. And help each person in our country, Lord, in our province, in all of the provinces, Lord, to follow the directions, to be careful, but not too careful, Lord. Help us to connect. Help us to love each other through different ways, ways that are not the same, ways that may become the new normal. Be with us, Lord, and help us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, you are a baptized people, a community of hope, the new race dedicated to doing the unlikely deeds of grace and sometimes even take on the impossible. The blessings of the Father, the Redeemer, and Inspirer will always be with you now and forevermore. Amen. Lord, I come. 